welcome to the Festival of Storytellers. tell you how excited I am to be on right now. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks of, of excitement uh, getting prepared and I've done a lot of things in my life but this has got to be close to the top. Thank you. And Reed is magnet and I thank you John for um, putting this forth and taking the chance on our authors in, in, uh, in presenting this out to, to the world. I've, I've enjoyed this immensely Joanne. Ellie so have I. Thank you for, for who you are and thank you Reader's Magnet. You all are beautiful and you've worked so very hard and we are blessed. We, we are. are. I thank everybody that's involved with this process because we know writers need readers and writers need publishers. We thank Readers Magnet and everybody that's involved. I love Readers Magnet. They say, we share your stories with the world. Hello, my name is David Vancelet, and I'm very pleased to be with you today. We're a little late getting started. My apologies. There are some technical issues, and it's computers. What can, what can I say? <clears throat> this is my second uh, go-round in the live booth, so I thought I would just try to give a quick uh, recap of what I talked about the first time because it's, it builds on each other. Uh, symbolism is uh, how God thinks, and it's also how we think as human beings. One American philosopher uh, said, human beings think. We think only, only in symbols. So every time we look at something, we don't have the thing in our brain, like if you're looking at a cake on a table, the cake is not in your brain, or that would be a massive headache. You have an image of the cake, and that image is a symbol. A symbol is something that stands for something else. A red light on uh, on the street tells you to stop. There's nothing in particular about red or a round circle or a light that means stop in and of itself. It's just a convention that we've made up. Well, God has made a convention as well. It's called human beings. And he made us to be in his image. Therefore, we are a symbol of him, and we stand for something else. We stand for him, both males and females. Uh, Eve had a sort of a double image, because not only was she made in God's image, but she was also taken out of Adam. So she's a representative of Adam as well. When God looks at Adam and Eve, he sees two symbols. He sees a symbol of himself in Adam, and he sees a symbol of all living people in Eve. Um, I think I'm going to go right to this uh, whiteboard and try to get into uh, symbolism this way. Um, let's see. How can I do this? Here we go. This is probably better. Here we have God. Well, let's see. Let's start with Adam and Eve. <clears throat> okay. Adam is made in God's image. <clears throat> and in marriage, Adam is married to Eve. So on the same level, since we are images of God, the way our human marriage relates to God, human marriage is a symbol itself. It's a symbol of God and, oh, this is not going to work. Let's see if I can do it. It's, it's a symbol of God. <laughs> Sorry about this. Everything's backwards. I feel like C-3PO. I'm backwards. Um, so... 
this is also a marriage. It's a marriage between God and his wife. And who is his wife? Us, believers in, in Jesus, in this age anyway. In the Old Testament age, it was believers in Jehovah. <clears throat> so Israel was called the wife of Jehovah. In the New Testament times, the church is called the bride of Christ. <clears throat> so marriage symbolism works on the, on the human level, the man and woman, and it also works on the spiritual, celestial level in heaven. God married to his wife. Where's my finger? There it is. God married to his wife, all the living. Now, there's additional... This, this is a jumping off point to sexual symbolism, which is what I said I was going to cover when I spoke last on Thursday night. <clears throat> sexual symbolism is fascinating. It's also... It's meant for adults. It's mostly, well, I was going to say mostly meant for Christians, but it really is meant for everybody because believers or non-believers are all blessed with a sexual relationship, which is supposed to be in marriage, and we'll discuss why that is. Um, <clears throat> I'll put this down for a second until I get a little deeper into the, into the symbolism. Okay, so this little talk about sexual symbolism, it's intended to enlighten Christians. Christians have kind of been on the sidelines uh, politically, and that's not supposed to be true. Jesus said, let your light shine so that men may know uh, the light that you have to shine on them. Um, and uh, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, is where Jesus said, you know, let your light. No one, no one takes their light and puts it under a basket because it, it won't give light. Uh, they put it on a, on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And we're supposed to give light to unbelievers, and unbelievers have just run wild with marriage and all kinds of sexual perversions, and I'm going to go into why these are perversions in God's eyes. Let me back up a little bit to something that I, I discussed um, last Thursday night, and that is the symbol of Moses. When Moses was leading the children of Israel through the desert, you remember after they left Egypt, they wandered around, excuse me, they wandered around um, actually northern Saudi Arabia, not the Sinai Peninsula, as they used to think. But they wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. And very early on in those 40 years, Moses, um, uh, the, the people were without water. They were in the desert and they ran out of water. I'm sure God led them to that point to make them trust in God for his provision. And that's exactly what he did. The people, though, they complained. God doesn't like complaining. He likes faith, trust, trust God that he will supply your needs. The people needed water. They went to Moses. They complained bitterly. And Moses was always the go-between. So he went to God and said, what am I going to do with these people? They keep, they're wanting to kill me. They want to go back to Egypt. And God said, take your staff, the one that I gave you to stand with before Pharaoh, and go up to that rock at the top of the hill and strike the rock with your staff. Moses did that. He climbed to the top, took his staff like a baseball bat and gave it a good whack. And water came out of this 20 foot high rock. And you can see pictures of that. I think the website is down now, but the, the website is splitrockresearch.org. All one word, splitrockresearch.org. And there are some fascinating pictures that some explorers took of not only the, the rock, and uh, the smooth stones below it, which would have been made smooth by all the water that poured out. But there were also other artifacts that, you know, were talked about in, uh, in the book of Exodus. Uh, it's a fascinating website. So um, all the water supplied the needs of Israel for like a year. Now, fast forward about 38 years or so, <clears throat> they have the same situation again. It's a new generation of people about to go into the promised land. And again, they're in the desert and they had run out of water. This time, God told uh, the people, again, dutifully complained to Moses. Moses went to God and said, and God said, Moses, go and speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. And that's all he said. And Moses went out and said, you rebels, do I have to take this, uh, strike this rock and give water to you? So Moses was way out of bounds here. He was angry. He was tired and fed up of all the complaining. He had shouldered so much of the burden of Israel these, these 38, 39 years. <clears throat> so 
He goes to the top and strikes the rock a second time, just like he did the first time. But God told him to speak to the rock. Why? Because God thinks in symbols. That rock was a symbol of Jesus, the Messiah. And it says in the New Testament that Jesus was that rock. I think it's in Corinthians somewhere. I'm not sure where. <clears throat> Didn't write it down. But <clears throat> Jesus was the rock. And Jesus was truly struck one time. He was crucified. But you strike him once, you don't strike him again. If you want blessing from him, you want spiritual water, spiritual refreshment, you speak to him, you pray to him. You don't strike him again uh, with your sin or with anything else. You just He is struck one time and one time only. This is deep symbolism, and God wanted that symbolism kept to a T. And Moses broke the symbolism. God punishes broken symbolism. And this is very important because he, he punishes broken symbolism even today. So if we're going to break symbolism, whether it's marriage, gender identity, or any of a host of other symbols that God has created in humanity, we are going to pay the price, guaranteed. <clears throat> so Moses' punishment was he wasn't allowed to go to the promised land. All those 40 years of grief that he had to bear from Israel, and now at the very end, because he struck the rock and broke symbolism, now he can't go into the promised land. At the very end, <clears throat> um, God was relating this story of the first time that he w struck the rock. And he said, you, you guys, 40 or 30, 38 years ago, 40 years ago, the same thing happened. And at that time, you know, I took your complaint and God said, strike the rock. But this time, this, this last time, I struck the rock for you to get water for you. But God wasn't pleased with what I did. And this is what Moses said. At that time, I pleaded with the Lord. O oh, sovereign Lord, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do the deeds and mighty works that you do? Let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill country and Lebanon. End of quote. Then Moses said, but because of you rebels, the Lord was angry with me. And he would not listen to me. God said, that's enough. Don't speak to me anymore about this issue. So that was Moses' punishment. Moses tried to butter him up. He really tried to butter up God and tell him how great he was and you know how getting ready to go into the land. No, God had nothing of it. You might remember from your, when you were children, your parents said, no, and don't ask me again. You know the, the attitude. And God was harsh with Moses because punishment for broken symbolism is harsh. And when God's anger is raised, he, he is emotional. God has emotions. I'll repeat something I said last time. God is half female. Not, you know, his pronouns in the New Testament, the Old Testament are, are male pronouns. But Adam and Eve both reflect different sides of God. He has an emotional side, which is better represented in, on earth by the female and a more, if you want to call it logical, or more, you know, less emotional, I guess is a good way to say it, less emotional side in the man. And two together make up a good picture of what God is like. Um, more about that later. So, um, back to that picture. Let me just show that one more time. God is the representative. He is the husband. We join in that in a covenant with God as his wife by saying, I believe. That's our commitment to him. It's like saying, I do, to your husband or wife. <clears throat> That's what we do to God. We say, in effect, I do. I accept you. I believe in you. Especially since Jesus died for our sins. That's the main thing we believe in. And also that he's our Lord, that he is going to take care of us, and we're going to try to follow him and obey him. This is all part of the marriage covenant with God. On the human side, we say, I do, to enter into that covenant, that marriage covenant with a, with a human female. And there are many, many um, symbols involved in marriage. Maybe I'll run through some of those now. I was going to save them for later, but we're short on time. So <clears throat> in, in human marriage, the man typically pursues the female. I mean, the female holds all the cards, guys. Let's face it. We, you know, they're beautiful. They know it. 
we want them and they know it. So they're going to play hard to get and we know it. So we pursue them. Um, let's see what else. Uh, God, in, in the same way, God, as the husband, pursues us. God is pursuing every single human being on the planet. And every day, every year, every century, every millennium, every day, every person is being sought out by God. How? God, through his Holy Spirit, is trying to knock on that door. He's trying to knock and see if you have any interest in forming that covenant relationship with God. People spend their whole life re resisting him and following Satan. They may not even know they're following Satan. But if you're resisting God, that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Because the more people Satan can turn away from God, the more people he will have on his side on Judgment Day, right before he gets thrown into hell. <clears throat> Some more symbols. Um, we are hesitant. Like I just was saying, you know, we turn away from God. We don't want God, especially if you're an unbeliever. If you're an unbeliever now, that's how you are right now. You don't want him. I'm busy. I have a headache. Heard that before, guys? I have a headache. I don't feel good. I'm tired. That's when, when you want some romance from your wife and she doesn't want it. You know, she holds the card. She can say no. She has the power of no. And um, that should be respected. <clears throat> but in 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 heavenly terms, we are the ones who resist God. In earthly terms, sometimes the woman resists us. And that's just another symbol. It's the way God designed humanity. Um, he designed male and female. You don't really think God made Adam and Eve. And these things that are seem to be true throughout the ages, you think that was a mistake on God's part? Not at all. That's designed into man and, and woman. Um, other things. <clears throat> God overshadows us. Um, I should go into that Mary symbolism right now. I'll save that one. Um, in, in sexuality, and here's where we get into some of the sexual symbolism. In, in human sexuality, the man penetrates, sorry to get graphic, but penetrates the female. In the heavenly relationship, it's not sex, but God penetrates our spirit. Again, you really think that was a mistake, the way God designed man and woman? No, not at all. He penetrates our spirit, and there, by doing that, we partake of his spirit. When we believe and make a covenant with God, he gives us his spirit indwelling us. As, as a new believer, the Holy Spirit will never leave us because we're born into his family. We're his wife and God will never kick us out. Why? Because if he kicks us out, that would be like him divorcing us. And he doesn't like, he hates divorce. Malachi, forget, maybe chapter three, I forget exactly what chapter. Malachi, God says, I hate divorce. And that's because when two people get divorced, that's a symbol. It's a broken symbol. It means that God, if, if the man is divorcing his wife on the human plane, that's like saying God, as the husband, is divorcing his wife on the spiritual plane, and God will never do that. So it's broken symbolism every time a man divorces his wife. On the other hand, if the woman divorces her husband, this is the symbolism that behind that act. That's like, all right, Eve saying, I divorce you, is like saying the wife is saying to God, I don't want you anymore. I don't need you anymore. And I want to just, I want to, I want to go away and do whatever I want. I don't want to be under your care anymore. And for that's like saying God is irresponsible. He's not a good husband. So when a woman divorces her husband, that's like God being told he's not a good husband. That's the symbolism. This is how God thinks. He thinks in terms of symbolism. And he created man and woman to be a microcosm of God and his wife, which is all of mankind. In Genesis 3.20, it says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. So when God sees Eve in the Garden of Eden, he was seeing beyond Eve. He was seeing, seeing all people for all time, all the ones who would get their life from Eve because everybody except Adam, every human ever born, is a child from Eve. Eve was ultimately their great, 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 however many greats, grandmother. Um, so Eve is the mother of all the living, and that's how God sees her, because God sees the wife 
as some of those living people, some of those living believers that were born by Eve. Okay, so um, <clears throat> more sexual symbolism. Okay, again, if you think God just sort of accidentally designed man and woman like this, uh, I would just submit to you, no, he didn't. This is part of the design. In the sexual act, um, who gets excited faster? The woman? No, no, not the woman. The woman climaxes much more slowly. Why is that? God designed it that way. Because in the spiritual realm, we, me, as a believer, as a wife of God, I respond to him much more slowly than he would like. And God symbolized that in the sexual act in the female. The female comes much more slowly. The man is like quick, you know, and he gets he gets a lot of pleasure, but it's quick. The woman gets much more pleasure if things are done right. And the man is patient and is doing what he should do to, to please his wife. She can have a much longer feel-good period. We'll just call it that so we don't get too graphic here. Um, and again, God does get, he actually gets pleasure from us in a spiritual relationship. When we allow him to penetrate our spirits, that pleases him. He gets pleasure from that. We also get pleasure. Our pleasure is eternal. It's everlasting. It never stops. I mean, it's and it's going to get better and better and better. As a wife of God, as I am a wife of God, it's going to only get better for me. I might respond to him slowly, but the blessing that I get from him lasts forever and ever. It never stops. So that is symbolic of the pleasure that a woman gets in the marriage relationship. So these sexual symbols are, like I said, they're not accidents. God designed men and women this way. And the more a man seeks to understand and please his wife, the closer he is going to be thinking along the same lines as God. This is another amazing thing about human marriage, that if you stay together and learn to live with your wife and your wife learns to live with her husband, you are going to learn and benefit a lot of information from God. And it's just, it's just how he made it. So stay married. Um, I am a, a divorcee. I divorced. Uh, I was divorced, um, and I'm remarried now. But and I, that was a mistake. Uh, I made mistakes in my first marriage, and my wife got tired of everything, and she walked away and divorced me. And I regret that. I regret that I didn't learn fast enough. Um, personally, I didn't have a real great relationship, uh, family relationship. My parents were divorced which puts me in a, in a group of people who are more likely to become divorced if your parents were. It just you know, goes from generation to generation, and you just don't learn the lessons. Um, okay, so we talked about divorce. We talked about the pleasure of the sex act. Um, let's talk about some objections that feminists have to this whole thing about sexual symbolism. The man being the leader. This is patriarchy. Uh, what feminists hate patriarchy. It's it's a for them it's a means of their oppression. The man is stronger, um, and I, I should also make mention of this. Um, in human terms, women are not going to like to hear this, but there's a good ending to it. So just bear with me for a few minutes. Let me check my watch. Okay. God made the man, Adam, first. He made him to be stronger than the woman. However, the man is still weaker than God. So when it comes right down to it, if you compare the strength of the man and the strength of the woman, we're about equal when you compare us both to God. God is just stronger. There's no, no two ways about it. He's dealt with strong figures before, Satan. He gave Satan much power much wisdom, much knowledge, much responsibility. He was overshadowing the throne of God. That was his position. He hovered above the throne of God to protect God against any other angels or demons or anyone else. Um, 
maybe even those who hadn't been created yet. But it, it, the, the Hebrew actually indicates that Satan was overhead, overshadowing uh, God in that position. So he had a very exalted position, very strong character. God had enough of the strong character. So he made man a little bit lower than the angels and a little weaker, woman a little weaker still, <clears throat> and that's seen in things like physical size. Um, there's Women are on average smaller than men. Of course, there were women who were taller than some men. But on average, worldwide, for all generations, men have been taller than women. This is called natural law. You just, you're fighting biology if you deny this. <clears throat> there's also some emotional. Uh, you can call it emotional strength or emotional weakness. The idea is there's an emotional difference between male and female. And there was a, an article in Psychology Today. Mm, I didn't write down the date. Email me if you want the date. You want to look this up. Um, they, they tried to see who reacted how in different scenarios. They had a man, several men, several women. And what they found was females reacted more and negatively to things like mutilated bodies, physical violence, suffering or dead animals, animals suffering or dead animals. And this was a pattern that they observed across ages 20 to 71. Consistently, women felt stronger with those images than men did. They were more bothered by them. They were more hurt by them emotionally. Men, not so much. Um, so, but they noticed this across from age 20 to 71. So it's hard to say that women are not emotionally more sensitive, let's put it that way, than men. That's another difference between male and female. And again, God made it that way. In our relationship with God, you and me as the wife of God, okay? So bring it back up again. As the wife of God, who's more sensitive, God or us? Who's more willing to say, eh, no, I, I don't want, I don't want to go through this, whatever God, whatever you're putting me through, I don't want this. Human beings, especially the, the men. I mean, God's, I, I, when I, when I sin, and I still sin, and there are times when I sin and I know I'm sinning. And I regret it later, but, you know, I've sinned. Okay, so I've sinned. And God, I can hear God saying to me, are you out of your mind? You're sinning against me on purpose? How could you do that? So who's weak in, in that scenario? The woman? No, I'm a guy, and I still sin. God has made the woman weaker to show me as a male what God thinks of me and my strength. You know what he thinks of my strength? Not so much. Not so much. So again, the symbolism of the woman is so important. <clears throat> oh, I forgot. I want to point out one thing before we sort of maybe leave this forever. Guess what? To, in God's eyes, men equal women. We're the same. Men are not better than women before God. We're equal before God. And that's something to keep in mind, especially men in marriage, maybe even in a tough marriage. <clears throat> They're equal to us. So if you are going to be, you know, offending them, hurting them, whatever, your prayers are going to be hindered. The Bible says that. God wants us to treat them with respect and gentleness because that's how he made them. He made them more gentle than us. He made them weaker. And in the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> After the sin, after Eve first sinned and then Adam followed right behind her, no doubt he would have jumped off a cliff if she asked him to do that too. Um, God gave difficult, changed his his relationship to man. He made man more. Um, he gave man more work to do. Man could, you know, was going to have to till the soil, but now it's going to be harder. It's going to be much harder. It's not going to yield its fruit, vegetables, like it did before. He's going to have to take, weeds are going to get in the way, bugs, all kinds of things. It's going to be harder for him. That was part of his punishment for following Eve and eating from the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. 
for Eve, he made her, he made a metaphysical change within Eve's spirit. When a woman gets married, a woman is more dependent in love on her husband. God made that change in the in a married woman, maybe not so much in a single woman. Single women still have a great desire to get married, but when the woman is married, God says to Adam or to Eve, the husband will rule over you. Now, we're not supposed to be dictators or you know jailers or anything of the sort. We're supposed to be loving, gentle, and whatever. And I still struggle with that myself. So but it's true that God made the man to rule over the woman. So I guess we're supposed to submit to each other. In Ephesians chapter 5, it mentions this. Submit yourselves to each other. Men, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. In the Lord. So if the men ask you something ungodly to do, you don't have to do it. But the, 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 if the man is acting properly, then... Everything in, will act in harmony when the man is acting properly and the woman is submitting to him. The woman can have her own opinion. The man can have an opinion. They, they can differ. They can talk it out. Ultimately, probably the woman should, should go with what the man says, unless you have a situation like Pontius Pilate and his wife. His wife went to Pontius Pilate while he was in court with Jesus, and she said, have nothing to do with that innocent man. Have nothing to do with him. I've suffered much in a dream for, from him today. <clears throat> so God can reach through the woman in ways that he sometimes can't through a man because men have a, maybe a stronger will. We, we're the ones who say, no, nah, I don't want you, God. I don't want you right now. I'm busy. I'm tired. I don't, I don't want to deal with you in our relationship right now. It's exactly what the woman sometimes says to us when she's tired. And we should recognize that. We, when a woman says something to us like that that rubs us the wrong way, Ask yourself as a guy, am I doing the same thing to God that she's doing to me? Symbolism works that way. It's a symbolic relationship. And the, the symbolism in marriage goes really deep. Many, many, you know, it just goes very deep. And you're going to have a hard time getting to the bottom of it. So, but you can always ask God, are you trying to tell me something by how she's acting, by what she's doing, by what she's saying? Are you trying to reach me, God? And a wise man will do that. Okay, so um, we've talked about some marriage symbols. If you have any questions, um, start typing them in if you haven't already. And if there's a stage manager, yeah, Frank, uh, if there are questions here, you can start feeding those to me in the last uh, 15 minutes that we have here. And I'll <clears throat> try to get into some additional things um, that I haven't gotten into yet. Um Ah, feminist objections. Let me just turn to page 124 and read some of the... So uh, I've said things like... Uh, <laughs> yeah, Frank says I would be able to help a lot of couples. Yeah, um, boy, if only people would listen to God's wisdom. Because if you don't, guess what? You're not arguing against God. You're arguing against biology. You can't change biology. Biology has been the same for 6,000 years or 6 million years, however long people have been on the earth. You just can't argue against biology. Gender change? I'm sorry, but you might think you're turning yourself into a woman if you're a man, a, a guy. Parents, don't do this to your kids. It's normal for kids to figure out, you know, if, if your little boy wears, wears a dress, comes out in a dress, he's experimenting. Tell him, explain the difference. And by the way, God does not like cross-dressing. So all of this, what's the cross-dressing? Um, forget the term for it, but you know what I'm talking about. Drag. All right, so there's, you know, RuPaul's drag whatever on some channel. I don't know what channel it's on. Where they, you know, promote cross-dressing. God doesn't like that. He likes division between male and female. He wants clear lines of distinction. Clothing should be female or it should be male. If you're going to wear slacks, okay, maybe, you know, I know slacks and shirts, I, I I was told this, I don't know if it's true or if it's still true, used to be true. You know, a male's zipper on his trousers point one direction. On a, on a woman, they point the other direction. 
I don't know if they still do that. Um, but at least there was a change. At least there was a, a noticeable difference between the two types of slacks. You know, women like to embroider and have, you know, frilly things. You know, sometimes some women don't, but a lot of women do. And um, it shows that there is a distinction. God wants a distinction between men and women because he designed us with clear distinctions. Um, okay, so again, feminist objections. If you don't agree with what I'm saying here as a feminist, what are you left with exactly? What are you basing your philosophy on? Because the only other philosophy, sorry about the shake, that's my fault, my leg at the table. What I'm basing this on is God. If you want to be different from what I'm saying from the Bible, you have to go away from God. You can't have God and not have what I'm just telling you now. So what, what's left? Well, I'll tell you what's left. Evolution. Survival of the fittest. Women, how do you think you would fare if you were up against the survival of the fittest competing against men? You wouldn't last too long because it would turn out into war. And unfortunately, men being stronger, um, it just wouldn't go well if there were, were an all-out war between men and women. And why should there be? I know there are wars in marriage and, you know, playful sometimes and other times, you know, knock down, drag out fights. And by the way, men don't ever hit a woman. That's just not right. The man is stronger. The man knows it. Um, might not admit it to the to the woman, but the man knows it. And don't hit a woman. She's not built for that. Um, and God ultimately <clears throat> will not force you to do anything. Neither should you force your wife to do something. God gives you free will. If you don't want to believe in him, if you don't want to enter that marriage covenant, that covenant where, you know, the you, you become a covenant believer in God, if you if you don't want that, God will not force you to do it. You'll have to answer for it on judgment day. It won't go well for you. Because there's no real reason why you should not submit to God. He created you and he loves you. He has such great things in store for you if you stop fighting him. If you're an unbeliever, hopefully, if you're a believer, you're not going to be fighting him either. But sometimes we do, don't we? As believers, we fight him. Don't, don't fight him. Okay. Um, husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner. First Peter chapter three verse seven. Um. Okay. Let me see. Can sexual sin overcome others hate? Okay, um, I'm going to get into a little bit of Andrea Dworkin and others who are dead set against anything that I have just said. Um, let's see, 144, let me get to 144, I'll just read a little bit of this. Okay, Mary, when she was told when she was visited by the angel Gabriel, I think it was, um, was told that she was going to become pregnant by God. Um, it wasn't a sexual thing. It was God somehow taking her egg and implanting uh, an X chromosome in there to, to make a male, which would be Jesus. Um, no, is it the Y? No, the women have the X. The man is the Y, I guess. So implanting a, a Y chromosome. To, to form a male, which would be Jesus. Don't know how that happened. It wasn't sexual. God didn't have some kind of sexual act performed on her. It was a spiritual act, but it affected her physically, obviously. She became pregnant. Um, when she said this, she said this to the, to, um, to the angel. How is it that this could be true? Oh, I'm on the wrong page. How could this be true, she said, since I am a virgin? The original Greek wording of that phrase is this. How will this be since I have never known a man? Very important, that word known. The word know throughout the Bible has a double meaning. It just it could mean cerebral head knowledge. It could also mean sensual knowledge, carnal knowledge of a man or a woman. And God obtains knowledge of our spirit by penetrating our spirit with his spirit. The man obtains carnal knowledge by penetrating the female. 
and obtaining an amazing amount of knowledge and feeling about what his wife is like uh, through that act. So the word no can mean a sexual act. And here Mary uses it that way. Um, Gabriel answers, um, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The feminists hate that word overshadow because sex requires an overshadowing and a penetration of the female by the male. The man, I don't want to get too graphic here, but you can read all the Cosmo magazines you want and they talk about all kinds of positions that sex can, you know, you can have in sex. But if you read between the lines, what most women prefer is the missionary position. Why? Because they get the most pleasure from that. Um, why did I say that? Um, okay. In the missionary position, that's when the man overshadows the woman, and that's what the feminists hate. <clears throat> and I'll give you an example of that in just a second. Um, the Most High will overshadow you feels offensive to many who subscribe to feminist ideologies. Andrea Dworkin is a Jewish writer, lived from 1946 to 2005. She expressed her revulsion in this way. Intercourse is taken to be her capitulation to him as a conqueror. The man in sex is a conqueror, according to Andrea Dworkin. It is a physical surrender of herself to him. Is that true? Yeah, it may be. She has to surrender to him as he penetrates. But you have to surrender to God. That's the symbolism. You have to surrender to God in order for him to penetrate your spirit. That's why he made it this way. That's why he designed the sex act this way. It wasn't an accident. Everything in sex was designed by God to be a symbol of his relationship to you as a believer. Okay. It is a physical surrender of herself to him. He occupies and rules her expresses his elemental dominance over her. Oh, they hate that dominance. By his possession of her in intercourse. Mary, in the view of the radical feminist, must have been oppressed by God in the same way. Was Mary oppressed? Apparently so. God oppressed Mary in the, in the mind of a feminist. <clears throat> feminist author Sarah McDavid Woods, in her hate-filled article, Jesus was a rape baby also echoed the opinion that Mary, mother of Jesus, was overshadowed by God, making him a rapist and a predator. Watch, watch the time here. Um, McDavid wrote, Mary was not a wild child, but a girl living in a rigid patriarchal world who was raped by her husband or a soldier or some other predator. In the biblical narrative, that predator was God. God the Father overshadowed the child bride, Mary, impregnating her with his one and only son. She reported the reported savior of the world. So you can just feel the hate dripping out of her writing. Um, running out of time. Uh, I figured we got started late. I knew I was going to run out of time. Okay, one question here. Um, do you see writing as a kind of spiritual or therapeutic practice? Yes, I do. Um, I came to these conclusions by reading the Bible cover to cover once a year for 45 plus years now. And every time I read something about the word no and seeing it in a sexual context, it did something with my head. I wanted to know more. Why? Um, and I realized how, how symbolic sexual act was. So, yes, writing... This book has been very cathartic and helped me understand, hopefully made me a better person, hopefully made me more respectful of women. Uh, my wife might argue with that. I have a long way to go. Um, but it's a great ride. And if you're not a believer in Jesus, please, you don't know when he's going to call you home. You just don't know. Don't put it off. Believe in Jesus. Become his bride. Say to him, I do accept you as my Savior the one who died for my sins. He's the only one. If you don't accept him, you're going to stand before God on judgment day in your sin because he will not have been your savior. And then you're left to deal with your sin before a holy God 
and that will not go well with you. I wish I had more time. I'm, I'm going to be back again tomorrow, Sunday, at 3 p.m., and I'm going to pick up right where I left off here. There's a lot more that I, I meant to cover, um, and I'm just not going to have time to get to it. Has writing and publishing a book changed the way you see yourself? Hmm. It's a success of a sort to finish a book. I've been working on this book for about 20 years, a long time. I've put it down for a couple of years at a time, several times, picked it back up. I really feel like God said, Dave, you have to write this book, period. You have to write it. And I would just say, hey, just write, just like a woman will sometimes say, nope, nope. I said to God, nope, I don't want to do this now. There I am playing the female, being reticent, you know, pushing back against my spiritual husband. It's just how he made marriage, and that's how he made gender. And I, when I say that, when I say, when I say to God, no, that's the first thing that ha hits me, that enters my mind is I'm acting just like a resistant wife would act toward me. And so therefore, I don't want to do that. Okay, God, I'll do what you want. I may not want to, but I will. So yes. What risks have you taken with your writing that have paid off? Hmm. Well, none as of yet. Um, it's a new book. It just came out at the beginning of September, so there's no financial gain from it yet. Um, there's a lot of marketing involved to get a book known. And whether I have the money to really make that happen on a larger stage, I don't know. Hopefully word of mouth will get out and uh, it'll do well. Uh, risks that I've taken that have paid off. Well, I understand things better now. And I can see if there are friends or if I have an opportunity to to say something, to point out something symbolic to someone, um, I'll, I'll take that opportunity and, and that's a payoff. That makes me feel good that I, I'm able to shed some light on how people think and maybe give people a little bit of understanding as to how God thinks. And that's the name of the book, How God Thinks. Um, the subtitle is Revealing God's Heart, not just his mind, his heart, how he feels. Revealing God's heart through the language of symbolism. So another question. What part of the book was the most fun to write? Hmm. It was fun to write about Michelangelo. I didn't get to that. I wanted to show you some pictures and uh, just explain some of the things he did that reminded me of, you know, of God. Um, maybe I'll get to that tomorrow. Probably not. But I'm also speaking Monday night at 6, just like it was 6 o'clock tonight, Monday and Wednesday and Friday. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 6 p.m. You can pick up more pieces of this. I won't be repeating a lot, so it'll be all new stuff. Um, the f most fun, hmm. you know, this is really, when, it, when you're talking broken symbolism, it's not fun. It's not fun to understand. Um to see, to see how God hurts when we break symbolism, when Moses broke symbolism by striking the rock twice and how he had to suffer uh, not going into the promised land after 40 years. It, I, I want to avoid breaking symbolism now. I want to get close to God. I want to be his friend. I want to be his lover. I want to be someone who is so sensitive to him that I know I can hear him breathe through his spirit, when his spirit leads me in a direction, I want to follow it immediately. That's where he wants us. He wants us to love him that deeply. And so that that's a payoff right there. Um, and it, it's fun to advance. It's fun to advance in my relationship with God through writing this down and clarifying. Because whenever you write something, you have to clarify it in your own head. Otherwise, it's going to be garbled when you write it. So there's, you know, re-editing and re-re-editing, you know, changing things around until it finally makes perfect sense, clear as a bell. And that's uh, that's what happened with this as well. So I've got seven o'clock. Thank you for those of you who hung in here. Um, and uh, I'm going to say goodbye. I'll be back tomorrow at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, Eastern time, three o'clock Eastern on Sunday. Goodbye now.